We have been attempting to cover very briefly and in a concentrated ma manner the ideas of the one, the unity, uh, looking into itself, seeing the two aspects of itself as being masculine, feminine, uh, positive, negative. I don't like the word. Someday, God help me, I'm going to manage to change it. Uh, I, pr I usually prefer projective, receptive for the two uh, aspects of the masculine feminine side of the tree and the principles that are involved. Uh, we have been considering the idea that Cosmic Father and that which Jesus of Nazareth, uh, that uh, glorious uh, Kabbalist, referred to as my father, <laughs> that this is shown on the tree of life as Hosma, uh, the masculine principle, the right uh, which heads the right-hand pillar of the tree of life as you face it. And that the mother principle, you remember Jesus said, who is my mother? <laughs> he was trying to show, we perhaps got a very partial expression of what he really taught, because please keep in mind, he also said that uh, to them I must speak in parables and then to his disciples, but to you it is given to know the various things relating to the kingdom. Now then, uh, the mother aspect, as I have tried to point out to you, this refers to that left-hand pillar as you look at it. And don't think of the left-hand uh, uh, path that you have read about in terms of theosophy and Kabbalah. We just do not have the same terminologies. Uh, we use more the various terminologies that relate to the actual aspects of our own consciousness, uh, remembering, please, that uh, you have to have two hands, a right hand and a left hand. Uh, you have to have uh, the two lobes of the brain. Uh, you have to have the right leg and the left leg. This is the way we attain balance and grow and experience things. Therefore, we have to think of the tree of life in its cosmic aspect as being a representation of the entire universe and therefore the larger manifestation of deity and in the uh, smaller aspect uh, this diagram should for you be representing what is called in kabbalah the microcosm that is the expressions of the microcosmic aspect of deity, which incidentally happens to be us. Most of you have heard me say many a time that we are the microscope of God. <coughs> we are the way deity sees, knows, and experiences the minute, the detail. Uh, most of you have heard me uh, give as an example the idea of the snowflake. From a point of view, that sees in one way only, that is, in a larger manner, we have nothing but a lovely bit of white, something falling down. Of course, here in Southern California, we don't see it. Nevertheless, uh, it uh, does exist. It does take place in our mountains anyway. Ne and, but when you put a microscope on this snowflake, you find the most glorious designs. They are exact, they are symmetrical, and they are always in terms of the hexagram. The hexagram, therefore, is in Kabbalah, although Kabbalah certainly didn't know from the scientific point of view that every snowflake uh, would have the hexagram background or its shape. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in Kabbalah, the hexagram is the cosmic aspect of life, whereas the pentagram is the microcosmic, or that is, the human evolution or the human development of the cosmic law and the hexagram remember which is also called the star of david is basically uh, a representation of the interlacing of the masculine and feminine principles of god and as i pointed out to you and did very strongly i believe last thursday night uh, the interlacing of the masculine-feminine aspects of God, this actually represents 
uh, the union of the masculine and feminine parts of deity. And through this union, we have what? The manifestation of life. The manifestation of the physical universe. Now that three, the three aspects above the supernal triad, as it is called in Kabbalah, uh, this is said to be beyond and above uh, the average human awareness. This is true. But remember this. Something may be beyond our, awa our awareness, but it may still be there and be the actual essence of our consciousness. Things may be there which we are not able to be aware of as yet. Uh, for example, think of the plant. Is the plant aware of what is uh, being done, the various activities that involve human beings or other creatures? It isn't, unless it affects it directly. Nevertheless, uh, these activities are taking place around the plant. And in the same way, even though average human consciousness on the three-dimensional level cannot be aware of what we call the supernal triad, that is, the Ahea, which is the divine name formula for the one, the I am, the beginning of the whirling, or the cosmic masculine principle, that is, the divine fatherhood of God as such, or the divine motherhood of God, which we chant in formula as Elohim. Still, even though we are not yet able to be aware of these as being the principles, that are behind and are actually the projecting principle from which all of the universe and everything that exists has been projected. Still, this is the reality that is around us and indeed that in lives us, that permeates us. It isn't something outside, it has to be inside because nothing can be outside the tree of life. In other words, nothing can be outside the universe. Nothing can be outside the consciousness of God, or it could not be. So from the union of the cosmic, masculine, feminine aspects of deity, you have the projection of what becomes a manifested universe. And in Kabbalah, the next part of the tree of life, that which is called the number four, or chesed, it is the blue circle, as you look upon it there on the tree on the right-hand side. This is called in Hebrew chesed. It has other uh, names. It has terminology. Uh, the divine formula is actually ale, which is the, the divine name for that part of the projection of God. But remember this. This projection, which we call the number four, starts taking place from what is called across the abyss. The three supernals are beyond the ability for average three-dimensional consciousness of man, no matter how highly developed that man's mind may be. It is beyond the awareness of man. The experience of that part of deity, though, is possible. But then it becomes something other than three-dimensional awareness. In other words, certain spiritual experiences come to us where we touch the cosmic father, where we touch the cosmic mother, or where we become immersed in the cosmic father and or the cosmic mother, and or both, depending on the type of experience or the part of us that is stimulated and is having this particular awakening. Uh, also, there are times when we become immersed in the actual union of the father and the mother. And this is when we know love. This is when we know love. Now then, what is love? Well, you know, philosophers and poets have all tried to describe it, each in their own way. What is love? As a matter of fact, Surely we know that love is as many things as we have people to try to interpret it. But what is love? Actually, the first manifestation from across the abyss 
of these tremendous abstract principles of the divine father-mother un unity from which all things spring. In Kabbalah, it is called uh, Gedula. That's one of its many names, which means love. It also means mercy. And you see, mercy is what's written on, the, on uh, that particular sephira. And sephira, remember, means an emanation, you know, like uh, an emanation of light from the sun, a ray of light. It never separates from the sun. That light could go on into eternity, but it cannot be separated from its source, can it? Or it would cease being light or a ray. And in the same way, this projection, this light, this gadula, this love, as it is called, is also attributed to the function of memory. Now, I know modern science, and those of you who say, oh, forget modern science, let's have occultism. No, I will not. We've got to learn to correlate the above and the below. We have got to learn to utilize the, the mind and the discriminatory faculties, or we will get lost in bypaths. We will become lost in all sorts of illusions and delusions. We must keep ourselves focused and centered and rooted. And so we have to keep ourselves, you might say, in both the above and the below at the same time, and learn how to scan the difference by expanding our consciousness. So the function of memory is attributed to that part of the tree of life and that part of consciousness, which starts, as a matter of fact, the um, actual individualized part of consciousness. You, can, you cannot have anything like individualization until there is this projection from across the abyss. And memory is a very interesting attribution, because think for a moment. Let's see it in the way in the ways that we are accustomed to see it. Uh, let's go back to the analogy I love to use so often. What occurs when the uh, female ovum is stirred into life by the masculine sperm, that masculine spark? What occurs? Actually, the meeting of the two brings about what? The union of the masculine and feminine principle. And because of this union, you have a growth process that starts taking place, whether it be in a plant or an animal or a man. Or, of course, in this case, you might say in a woman, wouldn't you? <laughs> But we're talking about man in terms of the uh, genetic species at the moment. What happens then? The division, the multiplication, which is really by division, remember, nothing is really added from any outside. By dividing and dividing some more and dividing some more, we have something grow into something larger. That's illogical, isn't it? But that's how it happens. The development of a form takes place through division. And every single cell divides, organizes itself into a social unit, divides some more, until finally you have these many trillions of cells all functioning in an organized manner. But what has happened? Every single step of the way of the development of that first spark of the masculine and feminine principle coming together has been a recapitulation of the memory of the consciousness of God. Some people say, well, that's just nature. Are you going to separate nature from God? In that case, you are trying to worship uh, idols, aren't you? You're trying to say that something is separate from deity or God. And what would make a growth process take place with an organization that goes through very special fields of form, everything exactly as it must be, memory. Memory. Only memory can do it. 
When you have learned how to do something easily, then you do it rapidly. Haven't you tried to learn how to do various things? You've forgotten, perhaps, how you were when you first learned how to write, how carefully and laboriously you had to trace out every letter. But little by little, it became what? A habit pattern. Why? Because memory was there. And as memory became accustomed to the repetitive act, you had something that could happen easily. It's like people who can type. If you can really type, you don't have to think of each key on that typewriter. If you do, it's like that story I love to tell. I don't know how true it is, but you know, the uh, centipede, when asked, pray, which leg comes after which? And trying to figure it out, it fell on its back and couldn't move at all. <laughs> it lost its subconscious memory of how to do this, you see. It tried to take away from the subconscious realm, which is what? Memory that has learned how to do a thing a special way. And it has learned it because, it because it has done it over and over again. Therefore, the recapitulation of the growth of any creature in the womb of the mother or in, any, uh, in whatever passes for the womb when we think of the plant life is really a recapitulation of memory and therefore, the more highly evolved the creature, the longer a recapitulation, in a sense, and the faster it becomes. To begin with, it's slow and it's laborious. Finally, you become a man, you become a woman, and the growing of your vehicle, that is, the dividing of cells and multiplying, dividing of cells and multiplying, that is, by bringing them together in their division, this is done without thinking consciously about it anymore because you've learned how to do it, those of you who drive cars. If you start thinking about your gears and your, uh, and your brakes and all these various things consciously, you'd become like you were when you first learned how to drive, wouldn't you? It's only as you can put things into your subconscious uh, area that you can free your consciousness then for taking in other types of experience more fully. And all of evolution, then, is involved with the memory of God. Now, your personal memory, or the memory of your dog or cat, or the bird, or the plant, is not separate from the memory of God, is it? Again, I say to you, if you want to separate it, uh, you're trying to say that something is outside of deity, then how could it have come about? Everything has to be inside, or it couldn't be, because there can be nothing outside of God. There can be nothing outside of the uh, creative principle of life. All of space, really, is what? It's merely consciousness uh, imagining an area in which it is growing its own forms of thought and knowledge and awareness. All right, then memory... You think, you may, some of you are thinking, what's this got to do with love? Everything. <laughs> Don't forget, every one of you came about through an act of love. And some of you may say, oh, but my mother and father did not love each other. Well, there are different levels, aren't there? And an act of love can be taking place from a cosmic level, even though the personal level hasn't caught up with it. And therefore, they may think, I hate you. <laughs> Nevertheless, the... Uh, creation of a new center of an area for the expression and growth of an aspect of God takes place. And in Kabbalah we say nothing can take place except in and through the knowledge of God, you know, not a feather can be plucked, not a hair of the head can fall without the knowledge of deity. If deity is the one that has planned, organized, and is growing its own center, how else could it be? The point is that memory, uh, as an attribution of the fourth sephira, or emanation of God, which is actually the beginning of manifestation, really brings in to manifestation that which was originally intended 
it is the first result of love. Now, love is something we've got to try to understand together here. I cannot begin to tell you how often I have sat and listened to the most wonderful, adorable human being talk about love and say things like, well, of course, I've decided to just give up uh, personal love. What I want is divine love. Or, well, I've decided that uh, the uh, loan, the life of aloneness is for me, the life of a hermit, because I want to put all my consciousness on my aspiration, and I don't want it diverted. Or things like, um, you cannot give all of yourself to another human being because they let you down. How often have you said that to yourself? You cannot give all of yourself to another human being. They will let you down. Or they will try to destroy you. Or they will not understand. I have heard these things said many and many a time indeed. And, of course, it is quite true. You want to avoid being hurt, the stage of your evolution, be careful. Do not love. I agree with you. Just do not love, and you won't be hurt in that way. But then what will your life be like? What will it be like? Think for a moment. Think. What will be sparking you? How blue will the sky be? Will your heart lift because of the beauty of a bird? You think it would? Try it. I hope most of you have already tried it and have found out. You remember Khalil Gibran's statements about love in The Prophet? A lovely little book. If you haven't read it, I recommend you have it as something uh, by your bedside and think of it as highly as you would the Bible and almost as highly as you would the Book of Tokens. <laughs> I do. I re recommend this seriously. What he had to say about love is that if you would avoid the pain, certainly you can, uh, but you will be passing out of the life threshing ground. You will also avoid the heights because you will be avoiding the depths. And so, what will you be avoiding? You will be avoiding evolution. You will be avoiding growth. You see, the, the trouble is because we're so young and immature in certain areas, because, of course, we want to avoid pain. Look, I'll confess, I'll avoid it any chance I can, I, I can get. <laughs> and I'll work even twice as hard at trying to help my loved ones to avoid it. <laughs> but, of course, God interferes with me. <laughs> and my loved ones have grown in spite of me. <laughs> because when we love, we try to save our loved ones from pain. This is part of what love is, uh, when it hasn't seen a little more deeply, of course. Nevertheless, we have developed certain ideas about love and deeds. And we think we have become so smart when we say, well, I'm beyond personal love, for example. All I want is love of God. We've read about these things. Many people have written books on it. And we've had reports from people uh, who have claimed that they have experienced magnificent height and that they are no more subject uh, to uh, this lowly level of response you know that lowly human response of loving another person except in the abstract of course you have to love everybody you understand they tell you and of course what you have to love first is God well, let me tell you something. 
Here comes the free shock. And I intend to shock you very seriously, incidentally. Uh, because I intend to bring more love into this universe. <coughs> and if you don't want to love, well, that's your affair, but at least I'll say, well, God, <laughs> by God, I did my best. <laughs> the point is, every human being, after all, on the evolutionary scale, as well as any other living creature, has what? It has a certain capacity for living. Some of us have a cup full of livingness. Some of us have a quart full, some a gallon full, some of us more. Maybe there are some who have an ocean full of livingness. Now, what do you think makes the difference? If you want to be satisfied with a cup full or a quart full of livingness, uh, that's your concern. But if you want to attain cosmic love, if you want to know what real evolution is, in Kabbalah, there can be no question about what it is. And as far as I'm concerned, I've tested and tried it. And it's true. Evolution, life, and love are all synonymous. Those who decide they're going to be smart and save themselves from being hurt by not loving personally are outsmarting themselves. Very fortunately, life will not let them remain there too long. They might manage a few incarnations. But you see, if you're not willing to grow in and through and with love, then you... It isn't that you're going to avoid growth. What will happen is that you're going to be forced to your knees. Your cup of consciousness will be deepened in the fires of hell of your own consciousness, of course, because you will find yourself so utterly alone, God forbid, so lonely, God forbid, you will find yourself really alone in a way that will make everything empty. All of us know that when we have someone to share a little piece of God's beauty with, it becomes infinitely enhanced. When we have just one someone to share it with. Some of us may be able to uh, go into raptures alone over many things and this is good but there comes a time when all these raptures and beauties will become meaningless unless we can share them with someone with something because God is a unity even though we are separate uh, aspects of evolution we are not separate in our inner beingness, in our inner essence. And so love, as such, actually has to do with an awareness of the unity of one being with another. And this awareness cannot come, I repeat, it cannot come if you lock away the personal. How could it? Because isn't the whole idea of attaining cosmic consciousness, the bringing in of certain enlarged or cosmic awarenesses into the individualized, personalized aspect of deity, which happens to be each and every one of us. In Kabbalah, we have to bring God, the awareness of God, the awareness of love, into our everyday life and thought and emotion. And unless we're working on that, we are working on escapism. I remember how very charmed I was with the Buddhist philosophy when I first became immersed in it in my very young days. Let's see, I was only 21, we, uh, 22, really. You know, too bad I'm getting old. 22 already. Uh, 
<laughs> I became, when I became immersed in Buddhism, that's when I was very much younger, you understand. Uh, I remember also how wise it sounded to me, the whole idea of experiencing uh, the divine consciousness, although they didn't call it that. But getting the you-know-what out of this illusion, delusion, and snare, getting away from it, and getting into sam samadhi or nirvana. And so the idea of working to get up and away and into, this appealed to me because as far as I was concerned, uh, whoever this world uh, belonged to, he could have it back, <laughs> or she, or it, <laughs> and uh, all other conditions that existed. I, didn't, uh, I would just as soon have no part of it. Uh, as Buddhism said, life was pain. I couldn't agree with him more. In fact, uh, I was very much more intense about it than any Buddhist could ever be. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was quite um, appalled at the idea of being trapped into extra incarnations. Ye gods. Talk about hell. I mean, this sounded like the most terrible thing I could imagine. So, uh, yeah, I get out of it. Uh, that, that's the spirit. Well, I tell you, I really uh, got to work to test out a few of these uh, theories. See, the thing that got in my way, though, uh, actually, though I didn't realize it then, was that when I was a child, I was immersed in cosmic love every single night of my life. And the soul doesn't forget. Now, memory is not in the brain. Please bear this in mind. On the tree of life, Malchus is the brain consciousness, the physical universe. Memory is not there. If something it happens to the, injure the brain and a person can't remember, that doesn't mean that they've lost memory. What they've lost is an instrument that can register it while we are focused and concentrated in this particular yeah. sphere of expression. Just like uh, you can be a fine musician, but let a note go out, because our Marjorie is found out with this organ. She's a very fine musician, but when that, when something breaks down in that organ, she can play one note and it'll go as sour as could be, or it won't play at all. But it is, it isn't her fault. It's the instrument, and so uh, the brain certainly is an instrument for registering experience, but it isn't the memory. The memory is the a part of the higher mind, and in Kabbalah, the higher mind is involved with those three sephiris that are immediately below the supernal triad. You can see there are reflections like uh, in a lake or in water. And your higher mind is something that uh, is actually the real and eternal part of your individuality. It is actually your individuality as such. The yellow circle there is the Christ part of you called in Kabbalah the Mashiach, the Redeemer. And uh, this is really uh, becoming aware of yourself as being the child of the Most High. You know, when Jesus said, my Father and I are one, it was his awareness of those paths and connections. Well, the same is true of us. But uh, some of us don't know it yet. That's the difference. The only difference. All right, then. Uh, the love aspects of memory that have to do with the cosmic intention. They have to do, the love aspects of memory, they have to do with the realization that we recapitulate everything that we have done because each time we do it, you see, we become better. Like a typist, or skating, or learning how to walk, or write, or talk. Repetition makes us better. And memory is what's involved with uh, developing uh, this really natural and rapid uh, capacity so that we can go in for further growth. Now, love is involved in remembering who and what we are. Love is involved with that. If you think that you are just a separate creature, all on your own, you know, out to get up to samadhi or nirvana or cosmic consciousness, 
uh, and to get away from all this pain and misery, and certainly to get away from all these people. And if you've decided that you're spiritual because you're not going to let yourself get immersed or involved with these terrible people, and if you think that you're a spiritual being uh, because you have reached that high uh, realization that uh, love cannot exist anywhere except in love of God, as I said to you before, you're going to have some terrible shock and you're going to hold yourself into in incarnations for far longer than is necessary because the truth of the matter is that the capacity to love is completely involved with at least an intuitive knowledge even if we cannot uh, remember in the way that our three-dimensional consciousness thinks of, of memory but remember, intuition has to do with memory. It remembers in its higher consciousness, even though the brain uh, expression of the consciousness may not be able to register uh, those waves or levels of vibration. So that knowing who and what we are intuitively, that is knowing that we are one with uh, the creative principle of life or God, this is what gives us the capacity to love and it gives it to us because in knowing that we also know that everyone else and everything else is also <coughs> of in from and with deity or god now people get all confused with desire and love now desire is an expression of emptiness. In other words, desire, which I will talk about far more fully when we get to that sephirus, it's the green and uh, circle on the tree of life. And it's directly below, it's really an expression from the memory aspect of God, the mercy aspect of God, incidentally, which is in you. Uh, desire, as such, is reaching out to fill in an empty hole in the heart, in the consciousness. What we desire is that which we think or feel we haven't got. Now, we may have it, but if we think we haven't, we're going to go out and try to fill it. And this is what desire is. And the way we reach out to try to fulfill our desires is in accordance with the evolutionary age of our souls so that the younger souls will attempt to fulfill desire in one way the older souls in another nevertheless desire is mistaken for love over and over again but in actuality desire is in a way an offshoot of love in other words if love is pushing us towards evolution, which love is. Uh, then what occurs is that something within us desires the experience it needs to deepen its cup of capacity to love. So that desire is used by our consciousness, by our soul, by our higher soul, in, uh, to grow us. Now, those who try to tell you to kill out desire are just trying to tell you to kill the gasoline that runs the motor. And then you know how far you'll get. <laughs> you'll stall and you'll stay stalled because gasoline is that energy. Now, but love. Love is something that cannot be described in the usual terms, but I'm going to try to give you examples because all of you have loved whether you uh, have been willing to recognize it or not. All of you can love, and all of you need to understand just what place love has in your life if you wish to attain to that which you aspire to. Love is actually, really, in essence, the unity of God. That's what it is. Love is the unity of God. Every time we experience love, 
we are experiencing the unity of God, whether we know it consciously yet or not. Every time we feel a wash of love for another, we are experiencing the unity of God, whether we know it consciously or not. What is it that love has a need to do? Love always has a need to express itself in some way or other to the beloved. Love has a need to nurture the beloved. Of course, you have people who are egomaniacs and uh, who are immature, insecure, and they want another individual completely dependent on them. And they'll call it love. In other words, they want somebody else to be happy only if they're the ones who are going to give it to them. And they call it love. This is all right for that level or stage. Uh, but the point is, love has a need to give of itself. And therefore, this particular part of the tree of life is called uh, the self-impartation of deity. In other words, your capacity to feel any kind of, of unity, your capacity to have any awareness at all, is a self-impartation of divine consciousness. Because look, if you're looking at these flowers, what is really occurring? There has been a self-impartation, that is, a giving to you of vibrations which you have been able to receive and react to. So you are looking at some beautiful color and beautiful forms. That comes from New Zealand, by the way. Well, not direct, indirect. And the fact that you are able to be aware of the color and the form of this flower is actually an expression of the love of God. In other words, your awareness, your ability to be aware, your ability to react to any kind of beauty, the depth of your consciousness has to do with the depth of your love or ability and capacity to love. Now, how does capacity to love grow? It grows in only one way, by being willing to love. By being willing to love. But how many of us are willing to love? Some of the so-called finest marriages are a hope. You know that? A man and a woman who both decided they're not going to trust anybody. They should take a chance on getting hurt. Uh-uh. So they'll keep a part of their consciousness nicely locked away. They're not going to give all of themselves because that belongs to God. And if it belongs to God, it would be very wrong to give it to somebody else. And they say to themselves, how many times have you said it? Consciously. I hate to tell you how many times you say it to yourself unconsciously. I'm just asking you how many times have you said this to yourself consciously? And be thinking whether it's conscious or unconscious or subconscious, uh, in essence, goes something like this. Well, after all, we're supposed to learn from experience. Now, we're supposed to learn that uh, other people aren't remotely able to know us, understand us, feel us, accept us. And if we attempt to give all of ourselves to somebody else, then we deserve to get hurt. Isn't that what we say? Incidentally, that sounds good. Sounds marvelous. The point is this. Uh, the one error we make when we say this to ourselves is that we have made it so general now, it is true. If, for example, we have certain unresolved uh, problems in our emotions from past uh, karmic um, experiences, it's true, we, we will have gotten into a memory habit pattern subconsciously. And so we will find ourselves attracted 
to the various individuals who are not capable of receiving the kind of love we want to give. But the point is we pick people on the subconscious level who will be sure to make us very miserable indeed or just slightly miserable. We will choose people who will not understand us. Actually, it's because we didn't understand them. Uh, we will choose people who will betray us. Actually, it's because we are betraying our own uh, heart and mind in a sense. We are determined to stay within certain areas of unhappy experiences, not consciously, mind you, but because of getting stuck in a rut, in a record, in a pattern. You know how tied we get to these various patterns. <coughs> also, we will pick people who will uh, injure us or hurt us uh, for the projection of our love, who aren't capable of even remotely responding to our love or accepting it because we want to make sure we don't have to take on the responsibility of a relationship. And do you know that a great deal of our erroneous choices happens to be because we don't really want the full responsibility of a full relationship and we don't know it consciously? And why don't we want the full responsibility? for a full relationship because we do not feel in our deep, the deeper parts of our heart that we want, uh, are able to give it. We don't want to make ourselves vulnerable. I'd hate to tell you how many people have spoken to me about this vulnerability and how many people have looked at me in years gone by and perhaps even in the present definitely even in the present, and have spoken about this aspect, uh, this uh, being vulnerable, if one is willing to love fully. And my answer has been this. Unless we are able and willing to risk the climbing of a mountain, we'll never get to the mountaintop. Unless we're able and willing to risk the traffic, we're not going to get across the street. Unless we're able and willing to risk the repercussions of bad judgment and lack of discrimination in the relationship areas of our lives, we are not going to grow into the capacity to know what is more akin to us uh, for full relationship. Furthermore, we will not be growing ourselves into a capacity for it. People keep screaming, I want love. But how can you have whatever your concept is of the perfect love unless you know how to love? We attract to ourselves what we are. Now you'll say, oh, then how come that I was treated with such injustice? How come he or she was unfaithful to me? How come he or she walked out on me? How come he or she treated me so brutally? I was kind, I was thoughtful, I was giving my all. Really? Maybe one side was, but another side of the nature was definitely hitting one of those r repetitive patterns because the subconsciousness loves drama and the subconsciousness discovers that when we can say, oh, what an unhappy life I've had. I mean, this is much more interesting to others. How often have you decided to tell people all about the unhappy experiences of your life? <laughs> in order to make them like you. <laughs> you figured then they'd find you so fascinating, you know, the mysterious bad. It's uh, a lack of awareness. And 
And this awareness doesn't come unless we get knocked down over and over, just like walking doesn't come until we fall over and over again. So that very often it's just a lack of understanding of the principles of relationships that make us, uh, uh, on the subconscious level, deliberately choose the things that will keep us miserable because of erroneous patterns or immature patterns that we have not yet come to recognize and therefore outgrow. And we outgrow them only if we keep inviting them over and over again so that we can look the devil in the face. Can't you see that? Therefore, if you aspire to union with God, for example, true union with God, there are a lot of delusionary experiences that pass as that. If you aspire to know what uh, true cosmic love is, and if you don't now, you're going to sooner or later, why not now? Then please realize this. How can you remotely hope to know cosmic love until you are able to love as a human being? How? How can you? And how are you going to learn how to love as a human being? How are you, go how are you going to deepen the capacity for loving? How are you going to understand what love is and is not? Unless you're willing to get out there and risk yourself, that is, unless you're willing to get out there and take the bruises or the pain and say, well, now there I was again, I was wrong. That was a bad, uh, uh, that certainly was bad judgment. I didn't show discrimination here. I didn't notice that characteristic there. Um, I hope next time, never say I know next time, incidentally. That's murder. <laughs> <laughs> Always just hope. <laughs> I hope that next time I will become aware of these factors a little more rapidly. And therefore, we'll make better choices. Also, I hope that my own response has not only deepened my discrimination, but deepen my cup of lovingness so that I will start attracting magnetically uh, the quality. How do you expect quality unless you are quality? Of course, the trouble is most of us secretly figure we are quality and it's the other person who isn't. <laughs> That's where all the problems come in. <laughs> if only the other people had the quality too, I right there, then uh, uh, we wouldn't have any more problems, would we? <laughs> The point is, they um, usually reflect us. The truth is that some of the sweetest people uh, will find themselves acting like you know what because of an individual forcing that from them. In other words, we are not separate beings. We are telepathically in communion. And we, may, we are capable of reacting like angels in certain situations and like devils in others. And uh, I'm sure, I hope, every one of you have found, at least sometime or other, that like a, a virus, an epidemic, somebody's emotions have been so strong. I hope you've all had some such experience that you've seen yourself reacting in ways that are not usually natural with you. And incidentally, when you have done this, if you've watched it, if you haven't, watch, and you'll discover it. It will develop in you the kind of humility that gives you a greater capacity to love, and therefore to be loved. To love, and therefore to be loved. Loving is all that has any meaning in actuality. But what love is, is something so few of us know. Some of us get an, uh, an erroneous idea that love means being sort of wishy-washy, uh, like a Pollyanna, at, uh, where everybody is, well, after all, this is a divine soul. After all, this is a child of God. And they go around uh, uh, with this false front 
jabbering love. And let me tell you, if that person really loved, they wouldn't be, well, after all, this child is a divine uh, expression of God. They'd have more feeling. Now, feeling is not the same as uh, neurotic uh, emotionalism. Deep feeling and neurotic emotionalism are sometimes uh, thought of as representing each other by people, and they don't. We have to see the difference. We have to know what depth of response to another human being is as against this wild, neurotic emotionalism that just loves the dramatic scenes, and if they're not around, they'll make them. You know, they'll get, the people will often get into trouble just so they can have some good, wild, neurotic scenes and get them be the center of the stage, like a child. Children having tantrums, we get a little bit more subtle about it. That is, but it isn't subtle uh, to those who look at consciousness, to those who can see all these different vibratory uh, emanations uh, and the uh, elements behind them. But my darling, the point I want to make, and I want to make it as strongly as I possibly can, is this. If you have not yet learned how to choose a love object with discrimination, you are going to stop your growth if you decide that uh, you're just going to be intelligent and spiritual and love only God. <laughs> because it cannot be. It isn't that way. Your capacity to love God is exactly coordinated with your capacity to love personally. Those who say you've got to love but with detachment are mouthing words that are meaningless. They are meaningless. How can detachment and love be thought of as having the same meaning? Think of it. What is detachment? Detachment is to detach from. It's separate, isn't it? Loving is not separate. I ought to know about these things because I have had some very extraordinary uh, experiences, illuminations, hellish and heavenly, <laughs> and I wouldn't be without any of them. I have them now, heaven, heavenly and hellish. How can I avoid it? I don't wish to. This is the difference. I do not wish to avoid it because when the heart is not in a state of love, life is empty. No music plays for the ears with rapture if the heart is not in a state of love. No color inflames the heart with magic and miracle if the heart is not in a state of love. Haven't you noticed at times when you had been in love and then you'd been hurt <coughs> and it was a breaking down period. Uh, most of you, haven't you walked and found that though you knew in an objective way the beauty was around you, you couldn't feel it? Haven't you all had that? Beauty is there, and I cannot feel it. Is there anyone here who has not had that? That emptiness? It's like a death. It is death. Walking death. Beauty around us, we cannot feel it. Why? Because the heart at the moment has lost its object to love another human being. And until it manages to relate itself to love again, it cannot experience beauty. It cannot. How could it? No matter how much you may concentrate on I want to love God, <coughs> only as you are able to love other human beings. I don't mean necessarily uh, man, woman, husband, wife. Loving other human beings, though, means loving human beings. If you try to cut off one kind from yourself, and you say, well, I'll love my sister and I'll love my friend, but I won't love a man or and or I won't love a woman. 
I mean, you see, you're locking away. And, of course, the minute you lock that away, you're locking away the very gasoline that feeds the whole engine. Your willingness to love really has to do with your willingness to evolve, whether you recognize it consciously or not. And, as I pointed out to you before, your willingness to love means that you are willing to accept the pain if it should come. Though, I would advise you to stop uh, being sentimental when you hear a sad song of, oh, my love is gone, is gone, where can it be? Because you're just feeding an image that's sure going to give you that experience. <laughs> you know, that's what we do. The point is, when you become willing to be happy, it's only because you've become willing to love. Uh, even there, it's just practically synonymous. You can be suffering tremendous pain because of capacity to love. Yet if it doesn't stop you from the ability to love, you will be able to experience the joy, the glory of others. To know love for another human being in its deepest sense is the real secret of experiencing the cosmic and universal love that expands outward. Haven't you noticed, I hope everyone has been in love at least once, but haven't you noticed when you were in love that you loved everybody? You know that all the world loves a lover, the emanations that go out, the happiness that tingles, the radiance. Have you noticed how the, the faith, even people who are materialists, even people who are materialists talk about the, the glow that they see in people who happen to be in love at the moment. Although usually they say, huh, doesn't last long. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there's a secret to make it last. In my next course, when I give you the class course on polarity, if you're good little girls and boys, or even if you're bad little girls and boys, <laughs> I uh, hope I'll be able to get that secret across to you. There's a way to keep it to keep it alive and make it even more miraculous rather than less. Uh, but it doesn't, it cannot become that until and unless we get to understand love and become willing to love no matter what is going to happen. And incidentally, that doesn't mean that we start feeding negative images <laughs> and say, oh, I'm willing to love, you know, with the idea in the back of your mind that after all you're going to go in for some terrible unhappiness now. You see, this is not the idea at all. When when I had one time, more than once, but this particular time, I had a very uh, extreme experience of rejection. Mm -hmm. Uh, which uh, seemed to me to sort of uh, be a little more than uh, anyone should uh, have to take, really. I, I, I thought God was getting a little, I was sort of running away with himself or herself or itself. <laughs> and uh, I was quite, quite disturbed about the, about the situation indeed because it had been a repeat pattern I'd had all through my childhood. Uh, from the day I was born, I was rejected by everybody. You know, they, I was told I shouldn't tell personal things to class, that I should be the mysterious figure. But I feel that where certain of my personal experiences will help you. Uh, if I can't be mysterious, we'll just have to make the best of it, Alex. <laughs> In any case, uh, I had this consistent uh, rejection from the day I was born, where actually I went through the extraordinary condition of having absolutely no love at all. Uh, this may seem strange to you, but it is true. Absolutely none in any area. And I just marched all over the place hunting for it, uh, yearning for it. Uh, but uh, I certainly didn't receive it from any human being. However, I was very fortunate in that I was immersed in this uh, cosmic love of Bina, the uh, principle we took up last week, Cosmic Mother. I was immersed and floated. Uh, in this every single night through my entire childhood up until puberty and indeed this is the only reason I survived that extraordinary uh, childhood now the point is usually 
Of course, when children are subjected to this rejection and not having actual love in their environment, it will destroy their capacity to love if they had it. Because, you see, children learn by identifying with their surroundings. And by identifying with their surroundings, they start learning how to express the different facets of their nature. I didn't have that, but, you know, I was a very cunning soul. I loved books. I was a bookworm. And so I identified with the various books that appealed to me. You know, you have heroes and heroines. And even there, as you can see, even if you haven't got a thing on the physical plane, you have it in your consciousness, if your soul has gotten to the point where it knows how. And my soul apparently knew how. Because I was just determined, come hell or high water, I was going to love. And nobody could stop me. It sounds a little insane. But I believe in this kind of insanity. I hope more of us will develop it. Uh, because I know what riches it brings. At any rate, I did have a pattern, though. One doesn't get away scot-free from such uh, habit patterns. And I did have a pattern uh, of expectation on a subconscious level, which brought quite a few rejections. Uh, and I don't approve of them, incidentally. <laughs> <coughs> uh, the experience I had actually involved my little dog. So, uh, some of you, may perhaps most of you, have seen her beautiful picture. As you can see, and most, she's the most beautiful dog God ever made, except yours, of course. <laughs> And uh, after an experience of rejection of that kind, I will never forget the thing that occurred then because it was the whole question of love again came back, each on another arc, on another arc, a higher arc. And here again, uh, this whole idea of rejection. Something deep inside of me refused, absolutely refused, uh, to accept the things I had read in so many books. I was immersed in the realization that if I should give up being willing to love another human being, I would be committing spiritual suicide. If I decided to protect myself from being hurt, I would be stopping everything that meant everything to me, the capacity to be, to do, to grow, and therefore to project to others. I realized it intuitively, but it had not yet become sharpened in my consciousness at the time. And I recall how poignantly I broke down uh, in my emotions at the time. And actually, I started to have quite, uh, in a way, you might say, an argument with God <laughs> about this particular situation. When suddenly, just out of everywhereness so this love essence came back and although I had had experiences of cosmic consciousness many times already in occultism this was something special because I was back to the cosmic love aspect in a different way I immediately recognized part of the experience and yet I saw another level uh, had become open to me. And this immersion uh, of the cosmic love, the everywhereness, incidentally, it entered into me, it permeated through me. There wasn't a single hair, a single pore, a single atom that wasn't being bathed and held. And I'll tell you something that may shock you. I was not shunned. Because this love, cosmic, beautiful, rapturous, it was rapture. It was still impersonal. And I started to fight. I really started to fight. I started to fight with deity, the life power, the principle. And I said, all right, so I'm experiencing cosmic love. So all right, so it's immersing me. But it's impersonal. Damn it, it's impersonal. Excuse my spiritual language. And I want personal love, personal love. Now, this sounds unspiritual to you, doesn't it? You have read so much and heard so much about just love God and, and stop hunting for your love with people. <laughs> so you see, I wonder how many will drive away this week. <laughs> 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 but this was the... 
way I felt and I felt it with a profound intensity beyond anything I can describe. And then my little dog came over to love me and sympathize. And immersed as I was in this state of cosmic love, I looked at my little dog and I saw my little dog. Now, I was mad about her to begin with and that was bad enough. Uh, but this extra quality was there that was even more extreme, intense. And I looked at my little dog uh, with this essence in me, through me, because incidentally, no matter how I fought, fought, I ordered it out and everything, it wouldn't listen to me at all. You know, God just won't listen to us. <laughs> it's lucky. <laughs> but I, I was treated just as though uh, I was just a child in a tantrum, and this love essence had me, was going to stay in there, and that was that. Uh, so I, I looked at my little dog who came to love me, and I saw her completely differently. I looked into I thought that she was the most beautiful thing in the world, but she suddenly became the most beautiful thing in any universe uh, that was ever created, was now, or ever would be. You know, it's, it's a slight extension. The, the, <laughs> the depth of her eyes, the, the glimmer of every little bit of her fur, it took on a quality. I saw God in every little bit of her, from the tip of her tail to the top of her head. Uh, every little aspect glimmered and shimmered with light and with glory and with beauty. And she was sort of kissing me and cuddling. She knew I was so unhappy. I was weeping away, uh, unspiritually, you might think. <laughs> And uh, as uh, this experience came, my seeing her in this new way, I was suddenly hit. I tell you, talk about a realization of fantastic magnitude. This was it. it had to do with what? Love. What I realized was that I had been too busily trying to get love because of the pattern of emptiness as a child on the physical plane. I'd had it spiritually, but not physically. I had been so busily trying to get love that I was forever broadcasting an image, get, that means you haven't got. I'm a powerful being. <laughs> so I kept having the not getting. You see the idea, the rejection? that getting caught in a pattern, you see how subtle these things can be? Because my consciousness was reaching out to get. I was actually telling my subconsciousness that I'm empty of it. I haven't got it, I want it. And the result was I kept being made empty. Thinking I have and losing, thinking I have and losing. And uh, this thing hit me with, with uh, the most fantastic force. Along with that, I looked at my little dog, and I thought, again, because this, this awareness was uh, in every atom of my being and beyond, I said to myself, I love my dog, of course. How do I love my dog? Do I fuss at my dog because she is jealous? God, is she jealous. Penurious? She's stingy. <laughs> you should see what she did with her bone. She'd have a nervous breakdown if any other dog came along get her bow. <laughs> uh, oh, she was cunning. And she, she uh, no matter how much I fed her, she'd knock over garbage cans. I'd try to give her filet mignon, she'd stick her nose up and she'd go off and make a mess. I mean, I tell you, she was just, uh, her character was most reprehensible, very reprehensible indeed. <laughs> and I just adored every little reprehensible part of her. <laughs> she was so charming. She was so... Uh, alert. She, she was uh, a cosmic uh, entertainment. <laughs> uh, her emanations uh, were just rich with, with glory and beauty. And I said to myself, my God, I know how to love a dog, and I don't even know how to love a human being. This is fantastic. Fantastic. And I thought, what do I expect from my dog? Do I expect her to be grateful? She drove me crazy. 
<laughs> the things I'd have to do for her. The trouble I'd have with my neighbors. You have no idea. She was very mischievous. The things she damaged. Ooh, I'd hate to tell you. <laughs> but I wouldn't have given her up for anything on the God's green earth. Boy, they'd have had to fight me and tell you over my dead body. I loved that little dog. I do still, even though she's now not in a physical vehicle. But I had this tremendous realization. I knew how to love a little dog. I knew how to love a little cat. I knew how to love a little creature. I didn't know how to love a human being. And then I thought, oh, well, wait, wait, I'm not that bad. There's my sister, my sister. Ah, I know how to love my sister. <laughs> and I started to think a while and said, yes. I decided I'm not quite that bad. I have just the same type of feeling for my sister. I thought that God was very clever to create her. And uh, I was very pleased with the whole situation. There wasn't anything that she wanted. If it was in my power to give her, I wouldn't do for her. Even her faults were charming, as if I'm a little fatty, because they were her. In other words, I was grateful for her livingness, for the fact that she was livingness. And I thought, yes, there is one human being I have loved properly uh, most of the time. Well, you know, after all, we're a little human. But that's when I had the realization that one cannot remotely experience in life the things that one must in time until one knows not only what love is, but one is willing to get out there and learn how to love and be loved. Just like you can't get to that mountaintop unless you're willing to get you to go through the discomfort of taking a bad step or uh, stumbling over a stone and so on, which we will do. I realize this. And let me tell you, this whole experience was not just a one-day thing. For several weeks, I was alone. I saw no human being at all. I was immersed in these realizations that came fast and furious about love, immersed in it. And I came out of this experience with this realization that the one thing I had to do and concentrate on beyond all things was to teach myself, every fiber of my being, how to love and to forget about being loved. Let that take care of itself. The great joy in life is being able to love. To the degree we have the capacity to love, to that degree uh, in our hearts wash with glory. And so I started to practice loving, incidentally. And incidentally, the pra to practice loving, I first also had to realize all the things that I was. And I experienced every part of my being through the memory of that particular part of this affair I'm talking about. I, I experienced the full memory of my whole evolutionary line of beingness, not in its detail, but in its principles that had brought me to that point. And memory and love, remember <laughs> that I told you how uh, you cannot really separate them, in essence? I experienced that full line of my own self-evolution and knew it was true of all. I saw myself. I saw that every single man behind prison bars was my brother. I saw every corrupting, vile thing as my brother or sister. I saw every evil as being that which was part of me. I saw every good as that which I was and was growing towards. 